Hi everyone, welcome to this video where today we're talking about inductive reasoning and conjecture. It is the very first lesson before we start really diving deep into proofs. So we need to really understand exactly what it means to do inductive reasoning, how to make a conjecture, how to go to that next step, how to lead into a next statement, um, so that when we start doing our geometric and algebraic proofs, they go pretty smoothly. So we've got some definitions and terms we need to know first, and then we're going to go into a bunch of examples, okay? So first, inductive reasoning is using a number of precise examples to arrive at a conclusion. So when you do inductive reasoning, you're given information, and then based on that information, you're able to pick up on some key characteristics and then make an um, make. Um, a conclusion based on all of those reasonings. So here if I saw this list, the simple sequence, 2, 5, 8, 11, 14, it should be pretty clear to us that, you know what, I see that I'm adding by 3. So because I'm adding by 3, that would mean if I wanted to know what the next term is, I can say the next term can be found by adding 3, and the next term we should know is 17. Now that seems pretty obvious to us, especially coming out of algebra and, you know, middle school math where we have been, you know, working with sequences and this is obviously super basic, but this is just kind of an example before we get into geometric inductive reasoning that we would need. Okay, so we're going to take a look at some other sequences here. So it says make conjecture about the pattern and list the next term. So if I was looking at 5, negative 5, negative 20, negative 40, what do I see happening here in this pattern? I should see that I'm subtracting 15. So then if I see that that's my conjecture, then I can say that my next term would be a negative 55 because negative 40 minus 15 is negative 55. The next one, 0.25, 1, 4, 16. My conjecture would be that I'm multiplying by negative 4. So to get the next term, 16 times 4 is 64. 25, 5, 1, or point, one point, uh, 0 0.2, rather. I'm dividing by 5, or you can say you're multiplying by 1 fifth. So my next term, if I did 0 0.2 divided by 5, I would get 0 0.04. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. So this one doesn't look like it's adding by the same amount, subtracting by the same amount, multiplying or dividing. Well, we should hopefully know that this is the Fibonacci sequence where you add the first two terms to get the third term, and then you're always just adding the previous two terms to get the next. So 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8. Then I would need to do 5 plus 8 to get my next term. So to get the next term, I add the previous two terms, and 5 plus 8 would give me that. 13. So that is all about just looking at a sequence, using those examples to be able to make a conclusion and give that next answer. The conjecture is that actual statement. So I actually had it here and I apologize for that. Um, I should have shown that before, but the conjecture is what the actual statement would be based on all the examples that you're using, all that reasoning. So here, geometrically wise. Now this is where we really start to get into some geometry facts. It says make a conjecture about the geometric relationship. If I told you that angle MNP is a right angle, and I just gave you that information, angle MNP is a right angle, what is something that you think you could say for sure? If I tell you MNP is a right angle, something you could definitely say for sure is that the measure of angle MNP is 90 degrees because we know the definition of a right angle is that it has 90 degrees, so that would mean that that angle has an, a measure of 90. If I told you that the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B is equal to 90, what could be a conjecture I could make from this statement? One of them would be that they are complementary to each other because that's another definition that we've learned so far. If you have two angles that add up to 90, then those angles are complementary to each other. If I told you that point B is in between points A and C, okay, if I just say point B is somewhere in between A and C, I'm not saying it's smack dab in the middle, it's just somewhere in between A and C, what could you then say about those points? You could then say that segment, the measure of segment AB plus the measure, measure of segment BC is equal to AC. 
Something else you could then also say is that A, B, and C are collinear. That would be something. So if B is between A and C, you could say that points A, B, and C are collinear. That would be another conjecture. Triangle DEF is equilateral. So if I told you triangle DEF is equilateral, a conjecture that you could make, a statement that you know for a fact is true, could be that angle E is congruent to angle E. I'm sorry, angle D is congruent to angle E, which is congruent to angle F. Because the definition of an equilateral triangle is that all the sides are congruent to each other and all the angles are congruent to each other. I could have said that, you know, I could have listed all the sides. Segment DE is congruent to segment EF, which is congruent to segment DF and something like that. If I tell you that angle ABC and angle CBD form a linear pair, so you have to visualize what it meant for two angles to form a linear pair. If they form a linear pair, that means that they were two angles that create a straight line. And something else we know about angles that, are, that create a straight line is that those two angles would be supplementary because a linear pair adds up to 180. If I told you that points B, D, E, and F are non-collinear, Okay, if I told you points D, E, and F are non-collinear, a conjecture we could make about that statement is that points D, E, and F create a plane. Okay, because we learned the definition of a plane is created, defined by three non-collinear points. So if I'm telling you there's three non-collinear points, then I could say that they create a plane. Okay, next part, a counterexample. A counterexample is a false example to show that a conjecture is not true. So sometimes when you read a statement, you could say, you know what, um, there's plenty of times when this can be true, but I can think of a reason or a situation where something is not true, and that is called a counterexample. So if I said here, the sum of any two integers is positive. Now, when I'm thinking about basic integers, I could say, oh, well, four plus five is nine, and four plus five is a pos those are um, two integers, and if I add them up, they're positive. But I'm sure you could also think of two integers right now that if you added them up, you don't get a positive answer. So, for example, negative 4 plus a negative 2 is negative 6. Negative 4 and negative 2, those are integers, but when I add them up, I definitely don't get a positive answer. So there's plenty of examples where this is a true statement, but the moment you can come up with a statement that proves that it's not always true, that is your counterexample. Here's another one. Adjacent angles are congruent. Remember, adjacent means angles that are that share a side. Okay, they share a common ray and they have a common vertex. So I could have adjacent angles that are congruent to each other. Okay, their measures are equal. Or I could have adjacent angles where one angle is clearly bigger than the other. So for example, these are adjacent angles. Just because they're adjacent does not mean they have to be congruent. Can they be congruent? Yes. But are they always congruent? No. Complementary angles create a right angle. When we learn the definition of complementary, we learn that you could have two angles that add up to 90 degrees and make that perfect right angle, or complementary angles could add up to 90, but they could be completely separate from each other. They don't have to have a common vertex. So here would be just the basic example of complementary angles, a 30 degree and a 60 degree angle, but they definitely don't form a right angle. Okay. I'm going to give you a shot right now before I continue. If you want to pause right now and read through these six statements and see if you can come up with a counterexample, go for it. But it does say determine whether the conjecture is true or false. So some of these may be true statements where you can't come up with a conjecture. If false, provide a counterexample. All right. So if angle A and angle B are vertical angles, then their measures are equal. Is this conjecture true or false? If A and B are vertical angles, then their measures are equal. This is a true statement because the definition of vertical angles, they are angles that are created from the same lines. They are directly opposite from each other. They share a common vertex and they are congruent to each other. And if they're congruent, then their measures are equal. Next one, number two, if X is a real number, Okay, so any number in the world that you can think of, that's a real number, then 2x is greater than x. Okay, so think about this. If I was to plug in 3, 2 times 3 is 6. Is 6 greater than 3? Yes. But what happens when I plug in a number like 0? 2 times 0 is 0. Is 0 greater than 0? No. 
So that's a false statement then. If I plugged in a negative, if I plugged in negative three, two times negative three is negative six. Is negative six greater than negative three? It's not. So if I pick any negative value or zero, that would be a perfect um, counterexample for this statement. If two lines are perpendicular, then right angles are formed. That is a true statement. If two lines are perpendicular, then right angles are formed. Um, there's no counterexample for that. If you have two lines perpendicular, they don't create anything but a right angle. If two angles are supplementary, then they form a linear pair. If two angles are supplementary, then they form a linear pair. So we can think about this the same way we thought about complementary. Complementary angles can create a 90 degree angle together, like they could be adjacent, but they can also be separate from each other. So here, if two angles are supplementary, then they form a linear pair. That is false because they could be non-adjacent to each other. Linear pair is adjacent. Now, what if I switched the order of that statement? If I said two angles form a linear pair, are they supplementary? Then that answer would be true, just like it was in the previous screen. But if I say they're supplementary, then they form a linear pair. That's not always the tr a true statement. If points Q, R, and S are collinear, so Q, R, and S are collinear, then Q, R plus R, S equals Q, S. What do we think? Okay, so that could be false. There's something really important that's actually missing in this statement. Can you tell what it is? If points Q, R, and S are collinear, then Q, R plus R, S equals Q, S. Notice it didn't say R was in between. So you have to be very careful. It didn't say R is the midpoint. It didn't say R is in between. Um, when you are labeling a segment, the letters don't have to be in alphabetical order. Point S could have actually been in the middle. All it says is they're collinear, which means that they're all in the same line. But it doesn't mean that they are in any particular order. If it did say R was in between or it said S was in between, then we'd be able to make a statement. Last one here. If AB is equal to BC, then B is the midpoint of AC. So if I'm told that two segments have congruent measures then B must be the midpoint of AC. Something important is actually missing from this statement. Okay, what's missing is it doesn't say that A, B, and C are all collinear with each other. So technically, I could draw segment A, B, and B, C. They could have equal measures, but B is not the midpoint because it doesn't say anything about the, those points being collinear with each other. So that could definitely be a little tricky. Reading everything, reading all the words is super, super important. I hope this video was helpful for you. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.